broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network's second annual OA week. And we're going to go ahead and just give folks a couple more minutes to join us. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get started here in a minute or two. But you are here for the OA Research for Sustainability or ORS program overview uh, through the UN decade. So if that's what you intend to be viewing, you're in the right location. Great. Good morning, folks. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Go On's OA Week 2021. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our program here in just a minute or two, uh, focused on the ORS program through the UN decade. Uh, so uh, hang tight, and we'll go ahead and get started in just a minute. I think we'll go for it. Well, uh, good morning, uh, friends, and welcome to the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network's second annual OA Week. Uh, in addition to uh, Go On, this week's program is presented by three other sponsoring organizations uh, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, the OA International Coordinating Center that is supported through the International Atomic Energy Agency, as well as IOC UNESCO. Uh, and I am delighted to be here with you today announcing the first set of OA activities that have been officially endorsed through the UN Decade of Ocean Science. And that of course is the Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability Program or the ORS program. And while this uh, community discussion today is part of the OA Week agenda, it also holds the very special distinction of being an official UN Decade satellite event, which is specifically designed to help us understand how the ORS program will support implementation of the decade and achieve its overarching goals, which we know um, are to generate the targeted science we need for the ocean and community resiliency uh, that we want. And my name is Jesse Turner, and I'm the Secretariat for the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. Uh, and I'm honored to moderate today's 90-minute discussion, which will begin with an overview of the ORS program as debuted in a short five-minute video um, with several of the ORS program leads that you'll hear from. Uh, from there, we will introduce a panel discussion, including remarks from the Honorable Ambassador Peter Thompson, uh, our friend and UN Special Envoy for the Ocean, uh, before concluding with um, questions from you all, our guests, and today's participants. And just so you all know, the session is being recorded for those who aren't able to be uh, here with us today and, of course, to view uh, into the future. So we'll go ahead and get started with a brief overview of Go On for those who aren't familiar with its uh, network. So established in 2012, Go On is a unique international collaboration that is comprised of 900 members spanning from 105 countries organized across eight regional hubs, which you can see here. And Go On was created really to do three important things. Uh, the first is to improve our understanding of global OA conditions. The second is to improve our understanding of ecosystem response to OA. And the third is to optimize modeling uh, that will better predict global ocean change and its impacts. And so building upon nearly a decade of experiences and successes, Go On is launching this UN Decade Endorsed Program, ORS, which will help provide society with the observational and scientific information needed to better understand, monitor for, and adapt to ocean acidification. 
And so by growing capacity for coastal research, increased observations of climate related changing ocean conditions and identifying the potential impacts on marine species and ecosystems, ORS aims to support decision makers, policy leads and stakeholders with applicable knowledge that will inform OA response and build resiliency to local uh, to global scales. And uh, really to kick things off, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, start by turning it over uh, to play a quick video that describes the seven ORS outcomes in a bit more detail. So Carrie, turning it over to you.
Wonderful. Well, that is a powerful video and a very compelling launch of the ORS program. And I am all the more excited to be hosting uh, the panel discussion that's going to be uh, to be following uh, today. And you heard it here first, you know, the ORS uh, partners are really calling on all of us uh, here today and our partners and our networks to engage, um, to help identify strategies and partners within our respective regions our countries, institutions that are gonna help achieve the very necessarily ambitious outcomes of this next decade together. And uh, it's just so exciting to have this emphasis on OA science for decision makers and society just threaded through all of the outcomes and all of the uh, goals of the ORS program, which of course complements uh, the quite ambitious call to action through the decade. So to that end, it's my great privilege to introduce today's panel, uh, who will help us further explore some of these desired outcomes, roles, and opportunities in more detail. Uh, but I think what I'll do is, um, panelists, maybe don't turn on your camera quite yet, because we're gonna have um, some remarks uh, from a very special panelist uh, uh, who couldn't be here today. So uh, I'll go ahead and read your name, but go ahead and wait to turn on your, your camera. Uh, so today's roundtable will have Ms. Allison Clausen, Marine Policy and Regional Coordination Section with IOC UNESCO. Uh, Dr. Steve Whittacombe, Director of Science and Deputy Chief Executive at Plymouth M Marine Laboratory, uh, as well as Co-Chair of Go On, who you saw in the video. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, Dr. Jan Newton, Director of NANUS in the United States, Affiliate Professor at the Schools of Oceanography and Marine and Environmental Affairs, at the University of Washington, as well as director of the OA Center, or co-director of the OA Center at the University of Washington, and last but not least, co-chair of Go On, who you also heard speaking. But before we head into the roundtable discussion, I'm thrilled to turn it over to our friend, Ambassador Peter Thompson, UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean, uh, or as I refer to him, the great ambassador for all things UN SDG 14 and a champion for climate ocean action. So while Ambassador Thompson couldn't be here today in person, uh, to get us started, I've posed a question for him to reflect upon uh, to sort of lay the groundwork uh, for our discussion. So Ambassador Thompson, simply put, why do you consider addressing OA to be an urgent necessity in order to achieve the sustainable, resilience, and equitable decade that we want for ourselves and for each other? And further, what frameworks must we engage with in order to accomplish our shared goals? So Ambassador Thompson, over to you.
Wow, um, <laughs> that is always so uh, inspiring. Um, and thank you, Ambassador Thompson, for your meaningful uh, remarks and your leadership on this topic and many topics related to ocean and social health and equity. Um, and indeed, it is quite remarkable that you have authored such a significant letter to the COP26 president, um, President Sharma, calling on coordinated OA science and action through the UNFCCC and through the UN decade, which of course is why we are here today. Uh, and just want to underscore the importance of what you have called this all to, which is targeted science must be the basis for effective domestic, regional, local response. Um, and it's so important that Policymakers, decision makers, scientists, stakeholders, all of us um, really hold that as a, an important part of moving forward. And I think that's uh, just wonderful to have you involved in this effort. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and bring our panelists um, back and, uh, and get started. And so just for a reminder, uh, the three folks joining us today for an in-person discussion include Mrs. Allison Clausen, Marine Policy and Regional Coordination Section at IOC UNESCO. Uh, Dr. Steve Whittacombe, Director of Science and Deputy Chief Executive at Plymouth Marine Lab, as well as Co-Chair of GOLON. And Dr. Jan Newton, Director of NANUS in the United States, Affiliate Professor at the Schools of Oceanography and Marine and Environmental Affairs, Co-Corner of the OA Center at the University of Washington, as well as Co-Chair of GOLON. So panelists, can you go ahead and uh, Reveal yourselves. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm already just stirred by those uh, the video and the uh, and the remarks by Ambassador Thompson. So I think we are well set to jump in. Uh, so Allison, you're here with us uh, from the decade at this decade satellite event. Um, so we know that's why we're here. And while we also know the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development was launched this year and runs through 2030, and that its broad aims are to raise awareness of the many challenges facing our ocean and our ocean resources and to harness scientific research needed to solve them. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what it means to be an officially endorsed program of the decade. Uh, in short, what are our privileges and obligations to you? <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Jesse. Thanks to the entire OARS team for inviting me. i um, really, really pleased to be here today. And congratulations. I mean, congratulations for being one of the first set of endorsed programs under the decade. And for this launch today, um, I'd heard whispers in the corridors that the logo was being launched and that there was an amazing video. And effectively, um, it's, it's really impressive and, and great to see. So um, congratulations and thank you for having me. So obligations, responsibilities, privileges. Maybe to take a couple of steps back as you, as many of you know and, and, and explain to others, you know, the decade is built around this concept of action, right? It's science for action and the way that we're going to generate that action over the next 10 years is through these different calls for decade actions. We had the first one um, which was actually started in or launched in October last year that closed in January that all was submitted to and 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 was endorsed as as part of that um, there will be other calls for decade actions coming up um, very very soon so if we get time I can I can give you a bit of a sneak peek of, of what is coming up but from that first call for decade actions we had 28 programs out of around 200 submissions so we had you know 200 odd groups that put in submissions for programs and we had these first 28 programs that were that were endorsed and essentially you know this endorsement is really official recognition that the AUS program is part of this collective global movement of the decade the vision statement of the decade is the science we need the ocean we want and after a very thorough review process both you know from a from a technical point of view within the decade team but also by the decade advisory board it was considered that you know the AUS program program is, 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 is part of a group of programs that's proposing transformative ocean science that is really going to contribute to that vision statement. It's going to contribute knowledge and solutions to the sustainable development goals, both sustainable development goal 14, of course, but also many others where ocean knowledge is, is so critical. And it's also going to generate knowledge needed by a wide range of users. And Jesse, you mentioned policy, but there are also managers, there's private sector, there's innovators, there's, there's technology. So what do, what are some of the responsibilities and privileges? Well, maybe we start with the, the privileges first. You know, we, we sort of try and 
break the benefits of being an endorsed program or the privileges into three broad groups. I guess the first is knowing that your society, your 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 research program and the science and, and what you're doing is contributing to this global effort that has been endorsed across the UN system. You know, 193 countries, member states have said ocean science is a priority for the next decade and you're contributing to that. Secondly, it's around partnerships, right? And you've already got an amazing set of partners, but we really hope the decade will open up the door to new partners, both across disciplines, um, across different generations, across geographies, across user groups, that you really have that visibility to be able to reach out to new partners, both within the decade sort of stakeholder ecosystem and more broadly. I think there's also a question about resource mobilization, and this is something that does come up a lot um, with people who are interested in being part of the decade saying, how can it help? You know, the decade is not a pot of money. I think we've been, you know, very clear on that from the start. It wasn't one of the ambitions <laughs> of the decade, but we do aim to provide an interface or a matchmaking function, as, as, as we call it, between, you know, bringing these amazing transformative ocean science projects to the attention of the philanthropic community, to private sector, to development banks, to some of the financing institutions and helping to unlock new resources for ocean science. So those are some of the benefits. In terms of what we ask of you, I mean, it's all in your, it's all in your proposal, right? It's, it's, it's what you've proposed to do in terms of putting in place this transformative ocean science. You're engaging users. There's co-design elements that are integrated in that. We're really asking you to be very active participants in the decade stakeholder ecosystem through different communities of practice. And if we get time, I can explain explain a little bit more what we mean by that, but those are basically groups who are working on similar themes or on similar geographies coming together and working together to create even you know, synergies and optimize the collaboration. Um, we're soon going to be launching our global stakeholder forum, which will hopefully make that process uh, a, a lot easier. And we're really also looking to you to you know, to, to, to bring up the next generation of ocean scientists, to help engage partners in small island developing states and least developed countries, to contribute to global capacity development um, efforts, to contribute to, to, to awareness raising and, and, and transfer of technology and knowledge. So I think, you know, there, there's, there's nothing new in that. We hope to be able to provide the mechanisms and the, the, the structures to be able to do that. Um, and I, I, I think we're off to a very good start. And you know, we're, we're again, we're, we're, we're so pleased to have this, this really important program as part of the first set of, of flagship uh, decade actions for to start us off on this 10 year journey together. Well, thank you, Alison. I, I love the word flagship uh, associated with the ORS program. We'll take it. And um, and yeah, really appreciate the, the comments across the board about the opportunities and sort of how the decade is helping us leverage these other partners, these other resources, um, and, and the sort of shared community of practice, which I think is quite a nice segue maybe to the next question um, that I have for you, Steve, and, and Allison, if you want to jump in at the end and, and add anything uh, around the framework of how the, the decade might uh, structure uh, these types of communities of practice, um, feel encouraged. But, but Steve, you know, as I understand it, the ORS program has been endorsed by the decade, but will be part of a larger multi-stressor group uh, in some way, looking at climate impacts, including from OA, deoxygenation, and warming, all of which, of course, are expected to accelerate over the next decade, uh, as recently underscored in the IPCC's AR6 report. Uh, and so why is it important for the UN Decade Program for, for ORS to be expressly focused on OA? Why is that important? And why is it important to ensure that ORS is working alongside similar programs focused on other ocean changes caused by climate change? Uh, what can we learn about climate change's multiple impacts and stressors uh, under the, sort of the umbrella and organizing principle of the decade? Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Um, three questions there disguised as one. Well done, excellent. Um, so I've made a little note of, uh, so I don't forget each part of them, because each of them are really important elements of, that we need to address. I think Ambassador Thompson did a fantastic job to illustrate, you know, the, the precedence of, of looking at ocean acidification and the concerns associated with that science, and also the pressing need for strong and robust evidence uh, to underpin decision making of, of the highest quality. So, rather than repeat all of that excellent work, I'm I'm going to sort of focus more on 
from a scientist point of view, why I think it's important that ocean acidification research, uh, first of all, so focuses on, on, on the aspects of ocean acidification, not in isolation, um, but having a focus on OA to start with. Ours is not in isolation, it's providing a focus. Ocean acidification research is actually still relatively young. And we're talking about 20 years of research, really, and, and, that, and, and it seems to have gone by in, in, a, in an instant. Despite the huge amounts of knowledge and progress we've made, there's still a huge, an enormous amount of, uh, of unknown still, still out there. In particular, in terms of the specific dynamics and impacts of ocean acidification on different parts of the ecosystem. So how, how does ocean acidification affect all those processes, the nuts and bolts that, that hold ecosystems together? Um, some people would argue you know, that um, maybe we know enough uh, to know there's a problem. Well, we, we do know there's enough to be a pro no, there's a problem. But do we know enough to, to understand what the cures and solutions are? You know, it's all well and good going to a doctor and the doctor saying, yes, you're not very well, are you? Um, but really, you need to be able to understand the system to, to, to not only um, uh, sort of understand what that what that illness actually is, but also come up with a suitable cure in a suitable way. And and not the cures are not going to be the same in every context and with every person. So it's so important that we delve more deeply into the, the nuts and bolts of, of how ecosystems and the environment are interacting with these changes in carbon and chemistry. There's also specific skill sets and, and areas of expertise that are predominantly associated with ocean acidification, particularly around things like calcification, carbonate chemistry, you know, and whilst there are analogies in other areas, it's still important that we maintain those skills and build those skills to allow us to monitor and, and understand the impacts of OA. But onto the second part of your question, you know, why, why work alongside other stressors? Well, it's evident we don't live in a planet which is a single stressor environment. You know, there are multiple threats and challenges faced by the marine system today all the way from the other clim big climate stresses, deoxygenation, warming, changes in, in storminess, uh, changes in circulation, uh, productivity, nutrient supply, all of these things are operating together, as well as a whole host of other anthropogenic stresses. We talked about pollution, but the way in which we're, we're you know, habitat loss, um, the loss of complexity, resource extraction, fishing, uh, overfishing, all these things acting together. So the great thing about the ocean decade and, and these communities of, of practice is that it allows us to bring our various levels of expertise together with people with shared objectives and shared um, aspirations to be able to learn from each other, but also to bring things together in a much more holistic way. Mm -hmm. So finally, what can we learn about multiple stresses under the decade? Well, I think this is, this is very much about um, how we can learn from each other but also I think what the decade um, is really going to offer us is, is that transdisciplinary approach. So we've been very comfortable in our, in our scientific silos, working out how things are operating, how they work. But what we really need to do is take that next step to find out how the whole system works. So the end to end, the, the, the whole cycle. So understanding how the work we do influences the decisions that policymakers a challenge to make, understand how it affects the way in which um, societies interact with the environment around them and how not only we can support them but how they can support us as well in terms of generating that evidence and co-developing those kind of studies together. So hopefully that's covered the three aspects of your, your question. <laughs> Yes, and quite well done and, and thank you Steve. That's a tough uh, question to do in just a couple of minutes but really appreciate your call to sort of that transdisciplinary approach, which, you know, to Allison's point, if we're really trying to get science, usable science for response, particularly from resource managers, for example, um, you know, across a, a number of programs and buckets, you know, it really is that transdisciplinary approach that um, will give them a fuller picture of where their specific actions are relevant. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, well, uh, turning it over to you, uh, Jan, I uh, want to hone in a little bit now into the ORS program makeup or sort of how we are approaching the structure of the ORS program. Uh, as we heard at the top of this webinar, um, 
go on success over the last decade has just been incredible um you know and been there from the beginning and uh, and it's just amazing uh to to, to be here today, growing to over or nearly 900 scientists, more than 100 countries organized across eight regional hubs. Uh, and so in, that's impressive. Is ORS going to apply a similar approach of this regional coordination in order to deliver on the ORS outcomes? You know, what have been sort of the benefits and challenges of organizing science and research at that regional level versus that global level? Um, you know, through things like the IPCC. So how, how do we sort of tease that out um, and where do we focus? Thanks, Jesse, and, and greetings to you all from the uh, research vessel, Rachel Carson, <laughs> out on Puget Sound, and I hope I don't drop off, um, but uh, really glad to be able to share some thoughts with you. And Jesse, yeah, it's been incredibly successful um, at that regional level. I believe that ORS is really well served to continue to organize so at both scales, both regional and, and global, because they really serve each other. Um, you know, commonly we say in, in Go On that ocean acidification is a global issue with local effects. And you need that global context in order to understand the local effects. And you need the understanding the vignettes of all of those local conditions to really get a global view of, of, of the, the situation and the impacts and how OA plays out on, on local shorelines is different as, as we've been talking about based on you know the, the oceanography, the species, and the human dependencies. And it really underscores that need for the transdisciplinary work that, that um, Steve was just mentioning. So, um, I think that we really want to continue that, both for, but both scales need to inform policy. And that's where we really want the rubber to meet the road with ORS, is to put the, the focus on um, the outcomes, which are going to connect the observations with the people making decisions. And that needs to be on both scales, I think, so that we have um, information that um, and we interact a lot with, with global partners. We saw the three agencies that support um, Go On and the, um, the cascade of, of partners that have been involved during the, the endorsement of programs that, that we're um, connected with. So, um, so I think we want to keep the, the pedal on that. And you did ask a second question. And so what are the challenges and benefits? Well, I, I honestly, I think the, the benefits are incredibly obvious. And I want to give a shout out to some of the um, speakers in the OA week for um, people. If you haven't been observing that, check out the Go On website and see some of these speakers that have been organized by the regional hub, as well as our plenary speakers. And you're seeing examples of how people are putting their knowledge to use in applying to society. And then collectively, that information really feeds bodies like the IPCC and other um, uh, organizations to better understand how that uh, is really reflecting the reality. And then also, we can't lose sight of the global scale processes. If you heard our first plenary by Dick Healy and Kim Curry, um, there, the balance in both of those talks, talking about that, the global scale processes and then how that's important to understand something. So the, the benefits are amazing and um, the um, challenge, <laughs> I would say, aside from resources, which is always a, a challenge and more to the point, the, the inequity of resources. So that's something that we really want to work on with FORS. But, um, I would say the challenge is there's just a lot of entropy, right? And there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of coordination that needs to happen, and that takes time. But that, to me, is why the decade is so exciting, because we're going to have 10 years where we shine a light on that and really um, uh, engage more people as leaders. We need people to step up and to um, expand the participation within the hub and be inspired to maybe start a, a hub well where there isn't one already. And so, um, and moreover, to make sure that that's connected with 
decision makers on that that field. And and I really want to also give a shout out to some of our topical partners like Ambon and Gone, and how important it is to to work with um, those entities to be able to bring that multi-structured vision to bear on on how we make a difference. So thank you for that. No, that's that's all fantastic and uh and what i'm hearing you know it is that that global regional information that needs to be sort of layered that really does help inform that local or, or regional response and you know from my experience it's been as you know like it's an amazing engagement tool for policymakers, for other you know leaders to sort of i think sometimes when when you approach and say you know, do you want to work about on ocean acidification? Are you aware of ocean acidification work? Um, you know that you can be engaged in, and, and often it's sort of like, ah, oh, that's a global issue. You know, I've read the IPCC report, and uh, and to be able to say, well, did you know that there's a regional hub, you know, in your region that is actively working on monitoring and, and science for local response uh, strategies, and it's just such an incredible engagement tool right off the top to bring in those stakeholders that otherwise might feel like they didn't have a place, you know, to, to land. And so it's just been such a, a remarkable thing to see the, the hubs through go on. Just as you said, the speakers through this week, just like, it's just amazing. Um, great. So Steve, back to, to you. Um, I want to hone in a little bit more about this local response strategies and particularly some of the knowledge gap priorities that will help fill those. So one of the major ORS outcomes is to increase understanding of OA's biological impacts on marine life. So can you share a little bit more about that outcome? What does it entail? Why is it so important to advance knowledge around biological impacts at different scales? Um, and, you know, since you have an, an audience here, you know, how can local researchers, communities, and other stakeholders engage in this work? Um, or why should they through ORS? <laughs> okay, uh, and I counted another three at least questions in there. Excellent. Okay, so why study the biological impacts? Um, well, as a biologist, I would say it's the most interesting part of it. But I think you need more of an you need more of a justification than that. Um, in essence, what the biology offers is is the so what question. If you talk to a lot of people, you know the the concept of changing carbonate chemistry was might be of interest, of, of, of some minor concern. In essence, it's the consequences that's going to have for, for real, real people, for communities, for, for societies. And often that consequence is, is translated through our interaction with the biological component of, of marine ecosystems. Provides the, you know, as Peter listed off, uh, some of the, the many goods and services we, we get from marine systems, from the supply of, uh, uh, of uh, marine protein, food, fisheries, and aquaculture, through to leisure, uh, the ability to go and snorkel on a coral reef. Um, huge cultural benefits from marine ecosystems and the organisms that, that exist within that. Um, as well as sort of, um, uh, there was something else I wrote down as well in response to that question, it'll come back to me. Uh, oh, and just, just the sheer beauty of marine ecosystems. You can't fail to be inspired and, and um, and moved by by some of the marine systems and the organisms that live within them. So, so in essence, that gives us a, a so what and why are we why are we interested in? But it's really important as Jan sort of talking about the um, the scales as well. But before, before we move on to the scales, I think the key thing about ores and ocean acidification research is that we're now transitioning. We need to transition away from the what is happening to the why is it happening. It's critical that we, we challenge ourselves to understand why things are happening, because by understanding why, it then provides us with the, an, an ability and, an, and a capability to, to intervene and to try and, and try and adapt to or mitigate those changes that we're seeing. It's not enough now to just document the demise of the system. We need to be able to challenge ourselves to find the understanding to be able to either arrest our actions that are causing that demise, or at least find ways in which we can support its recovery or support the uh, the, 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 the stopping of that uh, that decline. Scales. Scales were immensely important biologically because 
because often we consider ocean acidification, but we don't consider the, the point at which the organism actually experiences ocean acidification. If I am an organism living within a seagrass bed, I'm not particularly interested in what ocean chemistry is doing out in the middle of the North Atlantic, nor am actually am I that interested in what the ocean chemistry is like several meters above the seagrass bed itself. What interests me or what can, impacts on me is the ocean acidification that happens around me and the sphere of influence around me. If I'm a biological process in, within an organism, again, it's not the the seawater around me that's perhaps of interest, but it's the it's the internal body fluids that surround the process that's, that's undertaking. So it's really important that we consider the scale at which things happen, the scale at which ocean acidification is interacting with, with either processes, organisms, populations, ecosystems. But the, the really fascinating and it's interesting thing about where ORS is looking to go is how we bring those scales together because it's all well and good having information at different scales, but the connectivity and the influence and the trade-offs between those scales is the thing that's really going to help us understand the system holistically. Um, you asked another question, um, again, on, on the importance of regional. So OA, as Jan said, is a global issue, but it has real local impacts. Ocean acidification is coming to an ecosystem near you very soon if it's not already there, and I would get wager that it's it's pretty much already there. You just perhaps haven't seen it yet, but it's coming and it's going to get stronger. And the solutions locally are going to be some of the strongest we have to deal with it in the short term. There's a lot of discussion about how we can remove the pressures we can control to build up resilience and resist and, and um, robustness within the systems to make them better able to to deal with the changes that we can't control at a local level. Mm -hmm. Your final question was about how can people get involved? Um, I think we've already said it, get involved. In, there is a GoAN hub near you, get involved, make those connections. And we're not just talking about scientists, we're talking policy makers, um, sort of st stakeholders, industry, get in touch with these local hubs, see how you can co-develop activities, see how you can get engaged in activities that have relevance to you at a local scale. And also you'll be, given a doorway into perhaps even operating, making networks of interest at a global scale as well. The regional hubs give people a doorway through to a national, uh, to an international conversation. Why should people do it? Well, we've, we, we've talked about the importance of, uh, of ecosystems. We've talked about the importance of getting involved. And also it's about being better aware about ocean acidification in your day-to-day -day job. So you may think, you may be an educator, you may be a policy maker, a decision maker, you may have all sorts of other things that, are, that you're dealing with, but actually bringing that ocean acidification aspect into that conversation is really important to be able to understand how it influences the things that you're controlling and the things that you're interested in on day to day. So that's what I would say is why, why you should be involved. That's great, Steve. And uh, just as a teaser to this group, is it true that there's an ORS website that will be up and launched coming to folks soon that they can also access? <laughs> we don't have to read it right now, but, but uh, unless, unless we have it, but uh, we'll put it up at the end probably. I'll, I'll defer to you. It's on. up, it's up. Oh, great, okay. Um, excellent. Well, I want to, before we go back to you, Allison, and get a little bit of a bigger picture, I want to do one more deeper dive into the ORS program that's really getting into, um, I think, one of the more complicated but most important components of this. So, Steve, we've talked about transdisciplinary um, whole system approaches. We've also talked about connectivity of different scales and the biological processes and trying to, it's not just enough to have a lot of different information at different scales, we need to bring it together. That's also true of this societally relevant predictions and projections, meaning impacts to human communities and exploring vulnerabilities across human communities um, and sort of blending this natural and social science component, um, really getting at the heart of what all of this is about. Uh, and so one of the ORS major outcomes is to develop societally relevant predictions and projections of OA impacts um, and to understand those implications uh, and to, uh, you know, to facilitate effective adaptation strategies. 
which essentially, as I understand it, is how OA may impact society, communities, humans. Um, so Jan, I want to turn it over to you. This is a complex and new and sort of emerging, I think, area around thinking about OA impacts and vulnerabilities. But can you tell us a little bit more about your experience or thoughts around OA's social, economic, and cultural impacts on humans? Are there templates or examples of this kind of effort? How will ORs take on sort of this type of lens? Uh, and why are predictions and, and observing models to some extent really impactful here? You know, how can those help us make these types of predictions? <laughs> Let's take that, that second, actually, the third question first. Um, yeah, uh, why are our predictions and, and observing models so important? Um, gosh, you know, we uh, go on third goal is about channeling information from chemical and biological observations to forecast and, and um, to, to modelers, whether it's forecast or, or just um, retrospective. And we had a plenary on that third goal. We heard from Samantha Sedlecki and Fabian Gopas some really concrete examples about how models are being used to then um, reveal, as, as Steve was saying, why some of the things are happening and then how that's being translated to resource managers, whether that's on local scales or um, national scales, you know, or, or globally. And so I really feel that um, the ability that models have to bring to bear um, for the kinds of things that we want to accomplish in ORS is, is just critical. And that's one area I would really like to see go on, or excuse me, ORS advance um, on in terms of creating more equitable um, capacity for that globally distributed. So um, cultural communities are going to really need that um, capability and increasingly so uh, to be able to plan for adaptation strategies. Right, and both observations and models contribute the power to be able to do that. And and so what we really want to do during ORS is, as I said earlier, to, to amp that capacity. We're, we've got the foundations there, but it, we need it to be more globally distributed, and we need it to have a stronger connection to the decision makers because it crosses the social, economic, and cultural fiber of, of society. And we're going to see that playing out ever more, ever more. And I, I want to add, just like on a personal note, because you sort of invited that in your question, um, you know, I, I started out as an um, observational oceanographer studying the pigments in copepod fecal pellets to understand how carbon and nitrogen was flowing through the food web, you know, and, and that's such a fun thing to tell your parents. But anyway, um, um, it was very much in embedded in biological oceanography. Um, and uh, that type of knowledge is so fundamental to our science, but it's not an either or, it's an and. That's what I really am excited to share is that I think what we're doing now and motivated, I've had the um, fortune to be involved in um, NOAA's focus on regional vulnerability assessment. And what we're doing is harnessing teams so that you have the people studying the very fundamental oceanographic um, principles, but you also have the social scientists working there and you have the modelers working there. And so it's that team working together. So people um, listening, I really want to encourage you to think about how you can combine, you know, not to diverge from what you're doing now, but how you can combine your knowledge with others' knowledge in um, sort of a, a co-design Team, not sort of a co-design team to then be able to um, contribute to our need to apply that to societal um, benefit. And I just have to say that um, in my personal experience, that has been incredibly gratifying. And I've learned so many things that I would have never imagined from working hand in hand with a social scientist. And from working hand in hand, in, in my case, with uh, um, the coastal treaty tribes of the um, United States who have been the original observers of the ocean. And so really 
working together to co-design how we get those adaptation strategies that could be meaningful. So um, the, what I really hope that we're going to accomplish in ORS is to inspire more of that co-design so that people can be really contributing the skills that they have in um, a, a more amplified way. I hope that came across. You know, I'm still on my first cup of coffee. <laughs> Thank you. That was perfect and and wonderful, Jan. You you recovered my scrambled question perfectly. That was a, that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, well, we'll do one more question for the panel and then uh, open it up maybe for for folks on the uh, chat. So be ready to use the chat box, everybody, to uh, to submit questions. Uh, and then we'll conclude with a final question uh, to to you all that I have. But Allison. Um, as you are hearing, there is a lot of work happening uh, within the OA science community to ensure that science monitoring observations are helping to inform these local, regional um, scale response strategies. Um, and so to this end, we talk a lot you know, in our spheres about engaging end users um, and really ensuring that um, we have so many partners around the table um, that are involved in helping identify priority information needs. Uh, that will help us share these uh, response strategies. So this is a little bit of a jump, but I think you'll you'll understand it. In that context, I really wanted to know how the UN Decade of Ocean Science uh, and its endorsed programs are going to correspond or relate to the broader uh, UN SDG 2030 agenda, of course, where UN SDG 14, um, and also, which is the ocean goal, as well as SDG 13, the climate goal, where those live. Uh, and so will will the decade programs be encouraged to integrate um, across some of those relevant targets of the SDG goals? Will we want to work with government, civil society who are already part of making commitments around those goals? You know, how, how do they relate to each other or do they? I think in short, yes, they, they definitely do. Um, I think, you know, the the, the best way to think about the decade is as a convening framework, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to develop and we're trying to collectively, and using Jan's word because we use it a lot as well, co-design this framework, which is going to bring together users across generations, across genders, across geographies. And, and I think, you know, by doing, it's, it's only by doing this, by, by having that framework that you can bring together the end users, you can bring together different knowledge systems that we're going to really be able to have that ability to, to contribute to SDG 14 and to the other SDGs. I do want to come back to this just, just as a, well, not as an aside, an important point, because it's really interesting to hear both Steve and Jen talking so much about scales, um, you know, both as a challenge and also a solution. It's hard to work at scales, but it's absolutely necessary. The decade, you know, without wanting to present it as a panacea to, to, to all the, the woes of ocean science, is also thinking at that level of scale. So when we're talking about this as a framework, it's a framework across disciplines and across you know, these 10 big decade challenges, and this comes back to this idea of the different communities of practice that will be working around the challenges, but it's also a framework across scales. So it's obviously a global initiative, but there are also a number of regional task forces which are emerging um, in the Arctic, in the Southern Ocean, in the Mediterranean, the Western Tropical Atlantic, um, in, the, in, in Africa, in, in Southeast Asia and so on, and I can put the link to the website. So people are already starting to think at that regional level about some of the priorities for the decade and how ocean acidification can come together with capacity development needs and ocean observations and ocean literacy to, to really have that holistic vision at the regional level. And then similarly at the national level as well, where we have different national decade committees, which are you know, again voluntary mechanisms, but we have about 25, 26 countries who have already established these, which really are multi-stakeholder committees working at that, that national level to say, what are the priorities? And so one of the jobs of you know, the, the decade coordination unit within the IOC is then to make the connections from the programs to the regions to the national decade committees and also help these programs tap into you know tap into those different levels and hopefully contribute to this both this challenge and solution of really working working at scale so i think that's one one really important point about the decade it's not just a big global initiative it's also trying to translate those priorities to the regional and to the local level and we even we have some programs as well who are starting to work particularly in urban areas at the subnational 
level um, with a great emphasis on how coastal subnational government authorities can start to be involved in or start to be in, increase their involvement in co-designing the science for coastal resilience, et cetera. So people are also starting to think about that subnational level through the through the decade. The SDG, so I have to say on this as well, as you very rightly mentioned, SDG 14, yes, it is our, you know, our guiding light, but there are so many other SDGs which are really, really critically, you know, in crying out for increased ocean knowledge, whether that's around food security or poverty, gender, uh, climate action, as 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 you said, um, sustainable cities. I mean, nearly when you do these mappings, and you know, there there are several of the you know very well respected articles with these mappings, and that you see these links across nearly all of the all of the SDGs. I would argue you could make the connection to you know to all all sixteen of the other SDGs. So what the what the decade has done is you know the theory of change is really that these actions all working together come together around these 10 big decade challenges around which these communities of practice will grow out now the idea is obviously not to create 10 silos there is interaction across challenges across communities of practice but they do tend to map more or less to different sdgs so that you know people can work within work within communities around similar themes and so on the idea is then by contributing to these 10 big decade challenges we contribute to, to reaching these sort of aspirational decade outcomes which was also um, so nicely illustrated in the video and thus contribute to the to the overall 2030 agenda and the sdgs now how are we going to track this because it's all very nice and well to say this is our theory of change programs will be contributing uh, monitoring information to the to the monitoring and evaluation framework some of your AWS program partners are, are members of an informal uh, working group on monitoring and evaluation which is has has been working to prepare a conceptual framework which will be built out over the next few months to a more detailed monitoring and evaluation framework or a framework to track impact and progress of the of the decade now obviously it's complicated there are questions about attribution it's questions of how can you actually say what is the decade contributing or what is you know what are other processes contributing but that's the sort of discussion and dialogue and, and, and exchange we're having at the moment to have a framework within which programs can contribute information so that we can demonstrate to the world at large how the decade is contributing to the 2030 agenda but also to other things to the UNF triple C to the Convention on Biological Diversity to the Samoa pathway to regional processes you know the, it, it, it goes it, it goes beyond uh, just the just the 2030 um, agenda and you know, coming back perhaps to, to the final part of the question is how are we collaborating with NGOs, with government, with private sector philanthropy? All of this is essential. I mean, they're all in one way or other, either helping to resource or to needing to use. And so we're bringing them all together in different co-design processes. Just coming back to, to, you know, something that I mentioned in passing in the first question, in the next six weeks or so, the Global Stakeholder Forum of the decade will be launched, which is basically where we're sort of describing it as the, the LinkedIn or the Facebook of the Ocean Decade, which will allow individuals to, to, you know, to join this online platform. And then within that, join different groups, communities of practice, um, where they have an interest and where they want to exchange, collaborate and, and dive into more details. Now, in that, there are groups of philanthropies, there are private sector groups, there are NGO groups. So you will be able to use that as a platform to really be able to find these partners that you want to work with, on different themes, different geographies, um, as, as part of your program, or as you know, getting involved in activities and programs that they're also running. So I guess at this point, the ecosystem is still taking shape. We're going to be looking to programs such as yourselves to help us shape that, help us tell us what you need to make it the most effective for you. But all those players, and we have really good partners in all of those, all of those groups are already there and helping us to, to really start thinking about, about these things. So more information to come on that soon in, in coming weeks, but I think it's gonna be a really, really important tool as the Global Stakeholder Forum to help make some of those connections. Great. Well, that's exciting and a lot of work, and I'm sure it has a lot of people engaged um, and a lot of spreadsheets probably working through uh, how <laughs> these things overlap and align and uh, and really appreciate you being here with us today, Allison, to sort of share that, um, you know, with us as a as a program. Um, so I will um, turn it over to the chat and uh, let's see, Carrie and Mike, you can tell me uh, if I'm allowed to read the questions. I think the answer is yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can I confirm that? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, 
Okay, so I'm getting a uh, one question. So I think that, let's see here, uh, we'll, we'll start with a question from Libby Jewett. Um, any ink, uh, who is, uh, for those of you, well, from Libby Jewett, uh, any inkling of opportunity to attract investment from philanthropies for important OA work? Um, so uh, open question to, to any of you. I'm happy to start with a sort of a decade point of view, if you, if you like. Um, tell, us, tell us how to get money from philanthropy. Tell us. <laughs> if only I knew. So, um, no, but I can tell you what the, we're trying. Give us the form and we'll fill it out. Go ahead. Okay, we can do that. No, but to be, I mean, to be very honest, we have a, we do have a group of very committed philanthropic foundations, um, very good geographical diversity. So foundations from South America and Australia and um, US, Europe, uh, Africa, who have, you know, met for the first time time in, a, in, a, in an in-person meeting. I think for a lot of people, it was the last in-person meeting before COVID in February 2020 to talk about not necessarily how big the check could be that they could write themselves, but how as philanthropies, they could help us set an ambition and leverage within the broader philanthropic community, you know, this unlocking of, of ocean science finance. Now, that group has been meeting regularly. Over the, over the course of the decade, they helped us put together a publication about the role of philanthropies um, in, the, in the ocean decade, and are very committed to really helping us, again, build out an ambition and bring in new partners for, for resource mobilization. As we're working with the programs, as many of you on the AWS team will know, we sent you out a, hopefully a relatively simple, but probably overly complex spreadsheet at the same time, and we did this with all the programs, asking you to tell us what your resource needs are, because we can't, you know, to, to be able to play that matchmaking role, I was saying, the beginning, whether it be with philanthropies or private sector, we need to know where where the key needs are. And so we got an amazing you know, response from the from the 28 programs everybody sent back in the worksheet. We've done some initial analysis, which has been really interesting, showing us that about a quarter of the resources that across the programs are needed for the first three years are already secured, which shows this is, you know, the decade is not an empty shell. There are real resources and investment already there. There's still 75% that needs to be found, but now we know exactly where those 75% are, whether it's in kind, whether it's financial, which program has which need. That information will get updated, refined, added to over the life of the decade, but we've already started presenting that to philanthropic partners, to private sector partners, and that's sort of going to be the, you know, the, the information that we that we are using. And I would say there is really strong interest from, from philanthropy in general for the decade, who see themselves as able to take, in many cases, risks that other types of funders can't take, um, who are, you know, often very mission driven, um, who can can invest in science uh, uh, like that end user co-design uh, approach to, in, you know, to engaging policymakers, to engaging private sector. So we're, we're very, very hopeful that this is something that will really build and grow over the life of the decade. Go, go ahead, Steve. I have a slight question for something. Go ahead. I, I was going to, I think, I think that's, that's a great, that's a great answer. I think we also have, a, I mean, as scientists, we also have a role to play here. Um, it's people, we only tend to care about what we know about. And we're very good at telling our stories within our own groups and to each other. But what we really need to do is tell the story much more widely. We need to make sure that the story of ocean acidification gets understood um, in, a, in a digestible and, and um, understandable way to, to everybody. So. We're the ones who understand what's going on. We're the ones who see it, we observe it, we experiment on it, we, we see the data. We can't keep it to ourselves. We have to make sure that we tell everyone who's prepared to listen, because once people are listening and understanding and seeing the world. Wait, Steve, lost you. Steve, a little bit with some, some frozen screen, but I really love where you're going with that answer. <laughs> uh, and I, I think it's, Let's see, Steve, we have you back. Well, wait a second. Uh, well, I think that's a good, Dev, I, I know where Steve, I think, was heading with that um, answer around, so, which dovetails to the second question that I see here, which is really, how do we make the most compelling case for OA work um, to be funded, uh, both through the ORS program, but I think broadly, 
uh, and really thinking about, you know, knowing that we're dealing with all of these um, different impacts, how do we make the most compelling case? Um, so I think that's where Steve was was sort of heading. Jan, anything you want to add to that? I'd love to, and then Steve invite you to to um, pile on. Um, so the, the most compelling case will be made by um, the, the citizenry, by the affected people. I mean, I'm sitting on this vessel because in the 2000s, shellfish growers were seeing effects of ocean acidification in the Pacific Northwest, and their voice not the scientist voice, but their voice backed by the science is what moved our legislature to establish a Washington OA center. And so the power of the people's voice is what's so important. And so where Steve was going in terms of getting more voices, being able to articulate the, um, the importance of, of the ocean and the importance of ocean acidification to people's livelihoods. That's what's really, I think, going to be the game changer and, and assure that we get resources in order to best plan for how would we adapt, mitigate, et cetera, this problem of ocean acidification, of course, in context of the other multiple stresses, but we really need that, that voice um, to be coming from the people because it's incredibly effective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no, that's great. Great. And Steve, I'm sorry, we, we lost you when you were right at us thinking, yes, this is a beautiful way to set up a response to this answer. But um, but we're just sort of talking about making the most compelling case for financing through both through the decade, but also outside the decade. So um, we cut you off uh, a little bit around, you know, we have a role to play and, uh, and we have a story to tell and, and we're the ones that need to sort of broaden to some extent a, a lens that we're applying to how this work fits into a larger picture. Is that where you were going with that? That's, absolute, that's absolutely spot on and Jan, Jan's really um, re really uh, explained that very well you know that we mustn't be shy in engaging right across the board um, we need to make sure that people understand what the issues are and um, and, and and get ourselves out there and engage and, and make people uh, appreciate the, the issues as, as we see them great I have got one more uh, question here and then uh, keep moving and maybe conclude with my final question to you all. Uh, so generally, can you tell us, um, oh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. This is from uh, Dr. Feely. Uh, can you tell us how the ORS program will be structured? Um, you know, what, how, where will, um, I think probably different projects be identified probably is, is where the question is, is headed. So how will the ORS program be structured to focus on specific projects? I, I can make a start at this as well. I think, I think the key thing, the way to envisage the ORS program is it's not, it's, it's, it's not how you would think of a typical research program in the fact that we have work packages and we're going to deliver this amount of research. What it is, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a signpost and it's a way of bringing people together and it's a way of providing shared vision, uh, shared energy, shared enthusiasm, uh, networking, bringing the right people together in the right places. The ORS is a framework to allow this work to happen. Those of us sat around this, this discussion here are not going to be the people who are going to deliver the research that's needed to underpin that science evidence. That's going to be the whole community out there. So what we're trying to do within within ORS is to facilitate that and help that to happen. So I mean, I had a little bit of a think about how how people could contribute to that and get get engaged with 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 ORS and and push our shared vision forwards. I mean, the first bullet point I had was was join the join GoAN and get involved in the regional hubs uh, and actually get get involved. Um, the other thing is about think about the science you want to do, write the projects, create the activities, bring the groups together, mm -hmm. see how you can engage with your national decade um, committees to, to encourage that kind of research at a national level or even at a regional level. Okay, We're looking for people out there to pick this up and run with it and champion it and actually do the research that, that's going to be needed to fulfill these seven outcomes that we outlined. 
you know those 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 are the aspirations of where we want to move forward but it's going to require people to actually do that science and research to fulfill those actions deliver those actions contribute to working groups as and when they'll become available go and develops its own working groups for key particular areas. We've got a biological working group. We're very interested in, uh, in the certified reference materials and the supply of those. There are opportunities that these, these working groups will grow and get engaged in those. It's highly likely that ORS, in, through our discussions, we will try to, try to stimulate and, and, and create these kind of workshops and talking shops and networks so that people can, can start to bring together around a shared purpose. Mm -hmm. Build capacity. It's really important that we increase the amount of people and organizations and, and research groups who are able to do this kind of research. Within GoAN, we've got things like peer-to-peer -peer mentoring systems. So if you're new to ocean acidification, you can come in and learn how to do this research yourself. We've got GoAN in a box to start creating the, the infrastructure and technical capabilities to do OA research but it's about increasing that capability more broadly so that we've got more people able to answer these questions and engage in that research and finally bring a greater awareness of OA into your own work so whether you're a researcher whether you're an educator a policy maker a, a, a conservation manager or a planner try and bring ocean acidification into your thought processes and the research you do ORS, I hope, will provide the guidance, the stimulus, the network, the framework to allow you to do that. Somewhere to come to get guidance, but also to not only seek resources, but contribute resources too. Mm -hmm. That's a, a great answer, Steve. And I, I also think, I mean, you guys can tell me if I'm incorrect about this, but even as you say, sort of put your project together, bring the, you know, the, the co-design emphasis towards it with all the great sort of components and, and ideas that we chatted about here today. And, you know, whether or not there's even funding, you know, through the decade directly yet, that leveraging that to other potential funders, leveraging that it has a home within the decade, that it is feeding information through the decade uh, and through the ORS program, you know, I, I hope and, and believe that that is compelling to uh, to funders, you know, as, as an, another virtue of the, the project. Um, so that's great. So I think, um, let's see here. I think what we'll have to we'll do is uh, apologize to those questions we're not going to get to. I wanna end with one additional question to you all and you can sort of take um, take a, a flavor of it, uh, I, I say, how you'd like. My, uh, you know, of course we wanna say from your perspective, you know, what is needed to ensure success, you know, whether it's of the decade or of the ORS program. But I think another way that I'd like to ask the question to you all is, you know, in the coming decade, um, <laughs> which, you know, the first two years of it has have been, uh, you know, we've all experienced a lot of um, challenges and the need for flexibility and un embracing uncertainty to a large extent. Uh, but what are you all most, honestly, just kind of joyful about? You know, what what are you excited about with this work, um, and what keeps you motivated to keep um, seeing this important work through? You know, you all have full time uh, jobs. You know, this is all in addition to stuff you're already working on. So the amount of passion um, that you all bring, not just to go on, but to now the ORS program, is tremendous. Um, so I just want to conclude. Um, Maybe Allison, I'll start with you, uh, but it's sort of, you know, what are you joyful about? What's getting you excited for the next decade? And, and maybe that answer will translate to what is required for success. <laughs> Perfect. Well, first of all, I must say, this is my full-time job, so I have the luxury of, of, being able to, of being able to do this as a, as a full-time job. But look, what am I most, what am I most joyful about? I think, and most, you know, I think the response to that first call for decade actions, I know for the, for the entire decade coordination team, we were, you know, the, the, the depth of the submissions that came in, the thinking that had gone into them, these amazing ideas that, you know, came together or at least documented over a relatively short time. And the fact that we now have these 28 
transformative ocean science programs. Sure, they don't have all the funding they need, but this represents hundreds of partners across the world who have put in the time, the effort, the resources to get these programs up and running. And we're addressing ocean science in a way that it has never been addressed before. I mean, we're here talking today about just one of those programs. You multiply that out 28 times over and it gives you a, an idea of the breadth of what we're thinking about just for this first call. So I think for me that, that necessitate it. it it means that we're, we're we're compelled to continue this 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 journey together because we know that the there is a demand out there there is a community out there that that wants to be part of this decade and we're bringing in the philanthropies we're bringing in the private sector and we're able to share the messaging and i think one of steve's points you know what i'm seeing that's really great is we are starting to move outside our comfort zones and we're not always preaching to our peers and to the converted where we're really being able to use this decade as a way of tapping into some new conversations and that's extremely exciting and just before i finish a plug for the second call for decade actions it should be out on the 15th of october and to come back to one of other steve steve's other points there will actually be a call for projects to to join the oars program at that time as well as many of the other programs who are ready to identify new partners and projects so keep an eye on the ocean decade website and there'll be more instructions on how to follow that but 15th of October will be the launch date for the second call for decade actions and we'll start this whole thing all over again to identify <laughs> some new programs and some new partners. Wonderful well thank you so much Allison for joining us today and for all the work you and all of your colleagues are doing to make this happen uh, the amount of work is tremendous but uh, but we are grateful that you're doing it. Um, all right Steve over to you what are you joyful about? <laughs> okay. Um, before I answer that question, I just a quick plug for the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. And I think if anyone's had questions, uh, asked any questions, I'm sure we'll get around to trying to answer them on there. So they won't be lost. We'll, we'll do our best to, to, to answer those questions. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start with what is needed for success because I wrote down four things that I think are really critical. First one is a spirit of collaboration and sharing, and that's not just between us scientists. It's about between science disciplines, but also between stakeholders, and particularly sharing of ideas and data and also knowledge. So that's really important. The second one is innovation and creativity. We need to ensure that we create the, the advances we really want, and that's going to need new science ideas. It's going to need new technologies. It's going to need, need new approaches to policy and decision making right across the board. We need to start thinking outside the box. We need enthusiasm and commitment. Uh, from everyone involved. There needs to be a willingness, not only to generate the scientific evidence, but also to then to use it effectively. So there needs commitment ac across the piece. And finally, we've talked about it before, it's always going to need money and resource, but, it, but importantly, it's going to need that money and resource to be equitably distributed and, and actually targeted towards the places where it's really needed. There's no point throwing money back into the same places for the same old time whilst other places are getting neglected. So what am I most excited about this? I, I split it into three things. In terms of the decade itself, what excites me most about the decade is that the ocean is finally becoming recognized and has got a, has got a platform for itself. And we're all shouting about the ocean now and at an international forum. Suddenly people realize the ocean is there and it's really important. We all know it is, but now it's, it, the world is starting to wake up and recognize that. For oars itself, I think this is more about joining up the different skills and ideas and perspectives in particular and it's a much, to get a much better and more holistic view so it's working with new and different and interesting people with very different views very different perspectives to try and approach this thing together uh, and very much about finding solutions and ways in which we can help society mm -hmm. and my, my final point you asked about what motivates me because no i don't get paid for this um uh, i get to, paid to do the research but i don't get paid to do the, the go on work and the oars work Inherently, I love the ocean and I see the ocean is under threat and under pressure and is, is suffering. And I really want to be part of the solution rather than the problem. So that's what motivates me. Thanks, Steve. All right, uh, Dr. Newton, uh, over to you for final words and, uh, and what makes you excited? What are you joyful about? Thanks, Jesse. Um, very inspiring words. Um, Allison and Steve from both of you. Um, so, uh, gosh, where do I start? I, I guess I really, um, I believe in the human ability 
through science to better understand things, better understand the problems and the solutions. So, um, and I don't mean to be oversimple about it because if you've read the IPCC report and listened to Ambassador Johnson's words, you know, this, we're, we're really in a critical time. Um, but I think what's going to get us on a better trajectory is, is, is exactly the kind of thing that, that Steve just expressed. It's that passion for the ocean and to understand how critical the ocean is to society. We all know that. And we need more ocean champions to not just be a set of, of well-educated folks from a few areas, but to really um, share that broadly, globally, and to empower that passion. And that's what I'm excited about with this decade and I think to me one of the most exciting things about the decade is that it's a decade it's not a one to three year research project it's not a sound bite it is keep the gas on the pedal or keep the foot on the gas pedal for 10 years right and you know it, it's inspiring because when I think of 10 years ago um, we started go on in 2012 so we're nine years old that started with 60 people in a room from 20 nations and now look at the peer-to-peer -peer, look at the regional hub look at all that happened through those 10 years and so ORS is laying out through those seven outcomes where we want to get where we need to get in that next 10 years and so i what keeps me joyful is because i think people can do it i think people will be inspired to say look, you know, I'm an ocean scientist, or I'm a social scientist, or I'm a decision maker, or I'm a stakeholder, I need to be part of this. And, and I think collectively, we really can make a difference. It's, um, it's exciting, you know, that it's the decade, as I harped on, for ocean science for sustainable development. And ocean and sustainable is so critical, because the ocean does sustain us. We know that, and it's important that we really harness the energy around that to make sure that we have the best path forward. So um, it, it keeps me joyful because I I believe in, in humans' capacity to, to make some change. So let's do it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jan, and to all of our panelists and our hosts today. Uh, this was a great session. Um, I'm so uh, grateful to go on and organizers of OA Week for just a, a her monumental Herculean effort putting this program together. Uh, it's just been a delight. So for those of you that um, have not checked out the uh, the Go On website full of events this week, um, go ahead. They're ongoing all today and tomorrow. Uh, and then of course in the chat, you've got lots of information from organizers around using the OA Information Exchange to follow up on questions, uh, as well as more information about the ORS official launch website. Um, as well as UN Decade uh, websites and resources. So with that, um, maybe, Carrie, we can put up the final slide as people say goodbye. Um, but thank you so much to the three of you. You have made me an ocean convert. You have spread the word. Uh, this this desert girl from Nevada has now become an ocean person, uh, largely because of, of you all. So, um, so thank you. Yes, we can play the video um, for the fifth symposium. Oh, sorry, the symposium of a, in a high CO2 world. Um, to play everyone out. Excellent. There we go. Over over to uh, getting excited for 2022. Thanks, Jesse.